many times uh, people just believe like business events are made for like killing me and just destroying the earth. And my one friend said, you're the first business student that actually made me believe that, you know, business is not just like really the earth. <laughs> so, well, among many things that bring me joy, but watching anime, and when I'm not watching anime, <laughs> I didn't expect to have anyone in the audience actually join me. I'm so proud. When I'm not watching anime, I'm drawing anime. Wow. Wow. When I'm not doing that, I'm practicing Chinese, my Chinese, and maybe teaching people, and just um, trying to better myself and increase it as my second language. When I'm not doing that, I'm awkwardly trying to speak Turkish and scaring people that I should be drinking <laughs> my terrible grammar. When I'm not doing that, I'm writing poetry because I enjoy it so much. When I'm not doing that, <laughs> I'm thinking about my hair and how just how amazing it is and how it refuses to stay down. I always say that <laughs> the African hair was made to defy gravity. Yeah. So, uh, well, outside of all these things, what made me most uh, it brings me the most emotion is what brings me the most emotion is peace. It, I have to keep thinking about it because no matter what, I always come back to it. I always end up writing about it again. No matter how I deviate into other things, I still come back every time. And then I thought about it. Okay, so why is it? Sorry, my my brain is. <laughs> so I thought about it and I said that uh, this, this makes me like, you know, and I realized that there's nowhere in the world, in this time and age that we grew up in, there's nowhere in the world that is actually peaceful. Like, it's so normal for us to experience wars and hear about wars and disputes. So when I focused on it, I thought about it that, okay, in which way is it more, uh, how does it, how does it affect us as a per how does it affect you as a person? And I decided to not focus on world wars or the international picture. I decided to focus on the disputes, the internal situations that we have. Why is it that even when you're in your own country, everyone looks just like you, you end up fighting, you still end up having disputes. So I focused on uh, sorry I'm not talking about something very exciting. <laughs> I decided to focus on something very so I thought about it, okay, I thought about the Nigerian Civil War. And in this time, it started in 1967, and it lasted for 30 months. And in 30 months, a million plus civilian lives were lost, and 50,000 soldiers died in that time. So a wise professor of mine told me, don't focus on the things that are that happened before you came into this earth. Focus on the things that happened in your own timeline. So I did just that. And this drives me into my own story. So I grew up in the central north of Nigeria. Uh, I actually come from all the way from the south. And well, I was born in the central northern area. And what happened was I, I played a lot. Like I had the best childhood. Uh, all I was interested in was like eating tires. I'm sure some of you know that. <laughs> all I was interested in was like, you know, how straight it could go. <laughs> and just like climbing trees. I was like a mini school, like monkey. Uh, like playing all the time. And I started thinking recently, how many language did we actually speak? Because I grew up in a household where we speak English. But these kids that I was playing with, they were speaking very local languages and things. And I, I don't remember I was really speaking the same language. Then I realized we were speaking the language of play. We were understanding each other even if we were different. It wasn't important to me that, um, you know, his family, such a person's family prayed differently, or such a person's family talks in a different language, or, you know, they eat strange things. These things didn't matter to me. All that mattered was just how, how, how straight you know someone could kick the ball, or how 
how, uh, for instance, like Yang could climb from this tree and end up at the other tree. Or, you know, at one point, <laughs> it was really impressive to me how, you know, they would run around naked, and at some point, I was also interested in trying to just go with it. <laughs> but, you know, I got smashed by my older siblings, of course, so I didn't pick up my clothes and run wild. In this time, what it was was that ignorance was bliss. I had the best childhood because ignorance was bliss. But it was bliss, it was no longer bliss, because on a very fateful day, a dispute began. What happened was, in the central in Joss Plateau, the, it, the Birams are, are the farmers, and the Fulanis are the, they're the nomads. So a dispute began, not because the Fulanis were mainly Muslims, or that the Birams were mainly Christians. It began because they were fighting for land space. But in that time, as that dispute began, it became everything else. It became like really bad because people started focusing on other things and too many lives were lost between that time and 2001 and 2004. So over the, this time, from the time I was eight when this thing happened, uh, I started focusing on three main words. It started coming to my consciousness to understand why do I see these words everywhere? What do they really mean? And I looked at them in detail. And xenophobia is a fear of, of foreigners or strangers or anything foreign or strange. It's not actually discrimination. It's not where someone burns someone else off or anything. It means it's a natural fear that has not yet been um, put to action. I am the, of the argument that xenophobia actually is not exactly what we see on the news. It is the beginning of what we see on the news. The beginning is what, like, it started before it got that bad, actually. And I am of the opinion that xenophobia is something natural. It's something that we can't help, we can't avoid. Then, from xenophobia, we look on and we see that prejudice comes afterwards. It's an adverse judgment. Uh, or opinion that is formed beforehand without any good justification. When we look at this, we now move on to the next step and see that xenophobia, is, uh, discrimination is actually um, the onset. It comes after prejudice. It happens when there's unfair treatment, we actually start acting out that prejudice that we're feeling, which actually came from the natural fear of strangers that we initially had. So this, so this is the continuum. So I looked at it, okay, the comfort zone. When someone is in your comfort zone, it means that everyone looks like you there, they think like you, they talk like you, they pray like you, they act like you, they're actually you, so there's no difference. You might not fight, but you do not grow. And the world is too big to be with people that look just like you, act like you, think like you. So what happens is we start from the comfort zone. It means you actually decided to grow. Sometimes, some people didn't mean to grow, but they had to grow, or their parents sent them abroad, <laughs> so they had to go. And what happens is we see these different faces. You come into a new place, and you're thinking, these people look so strange, and they dance so funny, <laughs> and I don't understand why they talk that way, or you know, they have a funny click in the middle of <laughs> the things that they say. And because of that, we have this natural fear, and we begin to have opinions, we form prejudice, and as a result, we actually start to outrightly discriminate against other people. We, it started you know, as a little thing, but at some point, we actually start doing it. We take it everywhere we take it us. We take it to our classrooms, we take it to our workplaces, we take it to, in our, we make it, put it in our decision, in our reactions, in our actions, we become discriminatory, even when we didn't mean to, even when we believe we cannot um, do such things and we are peace people. We actually started doing something that we didn't believe we will. So what can you expect from discrimination? What you can expect from discrimination or discriminating is retaliation. Because they will fight back. Human beings are made to fight back. They will fight back. They're not fighting back because you know 
they just felt like it. They're fighting back for their skin, they're fighting back for their culture, the way their hair grows, the funny way their eyes look. They're fighting back because they cannot help how they are. <laughs> so they will fight back. And when they fight back, of course, I made it to continue and I touched it with stairway to unnecessary things because <laughs> I'm talking about the preliminary stages here. It just gets worse and worse. But before things get that bad, it doesn't have to get that bad. What can we do? So many great people, I was looking through Peace Advocates of Time Past, just beautiful and amazing people, which we all know already. Many of them we had one message, and that message was love and reconciliation. It came up over and over again every time they were trying to advocate for peace. And then I thought about it, okay, so what can we do in the 21st century? Because now a lot of people would think, oh, so unrealistic, and you know, what can we do? And what we can do is to be aware. When we are aware about, of what it is that, where we are, we can ask ourselves, okay, so where am I on this scale right now? Am I already discriminating against people? Am I already like avoiding a set of people? Am I already having opinions about people that may not be true, which I never found out about if it was true or not? Where am I on the scale? Am I dealing with xenophobia already? Am I about to venture into that world of unnecessary things. So what we can do is to be open-minded. Many times we, uh, we feel like, you know, I'm totally set for it, I can't deal with it, but we can't. We, we expect a lot of things. people leave their comfort zone, they travel all the way to another country and end up in their comfort zone because they never left. They traveled all the way, they ended up with people that look like them, think like them, talk like them, act like them, pray like them. They never ventured out, actually, of their comfort zone. And that place is where there is no growth. So, when we, must, we must go out, prepare to experience strange things. Prepare to see that strange dance and to see people that act a little funny from how you normally act, you know. Prepare yourself that you will see these things. Next up, what we have is that we must look beyond, we must overcome our ignorance, we must get over ourselves. Many times, people do not grow because they are so sure they're okay. Like, they're like, I had the best home training, I'm awesome, no one tells me anything because I'm great. <laughs> but <laughs> we're not. We always have to learn new things, we always have to embrace new cultures and new ways of doing things. So, um, next what do we have, we must approach and test the water. So, what if, so what if there is a strange click in the middle of their language? Start the click, practice the click, you know, do the click every time you speak. Just welcome in, you have to test the water. You know, you can't afford to just sit outside every time you do the strange circle dance and just be like, those people are weird. Join them, you know, try and break the circle, join the dance, do it. Test the water, you have to always test the water. Next, we have to apologize every time. We cannot expect that we will actually be right. We cannot expect that we will get it right every time. When we've done all that, we're trying our best, and they see that you're open-minded, they will welcome you in with, open hand, with an open heart. And then we have to be forgiven. When we are on the receiving end, we have to be forgiven when someone apologizes. In this day and age, we're fond of giving one chance and one chance only, but one chance is not enough in this time. It's like, I gave him one chance, that's all, I can't deal. But we have to be accepting and we have to be accepted. When we do these things, all these things I talked about actually the gooey emotion called love. <laughs> because when we think of it as we have to love our neighbor, we think, oh, well, you know, whatever. But I put in details like that because what happens is you step out of your comfort zone, you wind up with feelings of xenophobia, and you're just worried like these people are too straight. But what happens is when you work on it, instead of moving on to the ladder of some unnecessary things, you wind up finding love. And when you do that, wind up finding peace. What do we do next? There was a quote by Steve Jobs. He said that those that are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. 
And it surprised me so much because I was like, wow, Steve Jobs is asking us to be crazy people. <laughs> but we need to be crazy people. <laughs> so I'm ending my message here today to ask us all, please be crazy people. Do all the crazy things that bring about peace. Join that crazy dance, you know. Welcome them, be welcomed by them. And by doing so, we have to believe that peace is entirely possible. <laughs> Thank you.